Dan? Hey, Dan, what's our standoff distance, sir? Jonathan, you're going to have to pull up one of the Hurt GUI pages or one of the Grafana pages. Oh. And uh, yep, we work that out Where for yourself. It? Um, uh, my comfort level with uh, all the glass pointing down is uh, not quite there yet. I don't know how you can uh, determine that from here, but... Uh Going back to ocean adaptations, one of my, my favorite ones is the process of calcification. Uh, I think it's really incredible. These organisms are taking in the salts from seawater and literally turning them into their skeletons, their bones, and their structure. And this allows them to have that really upright morphology and growing upwards so that they can continue to feed and grow. Uh, it also can protect uh, some of these organisms from predation too. So Taylor, and is Pretty that something amazing. you could continue to record like every now and then? Roger that. Thank you. A, view, a viewer's asking, how close are you to the lower rift zone where the lava poured out and sections would break off? Well, I'm not sure about that. Um, I know that um, a few years ago we, we were here with the Nautilus. The eruptions were taking place on the east side of the island. And we actually were able to see them pouring into into the sea there, and we actually were able to measure um, some indication of them coming out below the surface too. But we're now on the south side, so I just I just don't know to be honest um, um, if there were recent eruptions here. Nothing we're seeing here looks terribly recent, but this is a very new island. It, it, but it's not wow. like wow. 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 features here. Yeah. Not. I think we would we would recognize that very clearly because it wouldn't have. Navest is all over the place with how it wants to that. display grids. Some prime real estate here. <laughs> yeah, and you'll notice too that you know they're not only pointing up, but they're also sort of pointing sideways into that in that little canyon to try to catch those particles. That come down. Running yeah. through, yeah. That's cool. And actually, to Larry's point earlier, it looks like on that left dike in the middle, there doesn't seem to be quite as much growing on that compared to the sides. Right, yeah, which again implies it's a expo purely exposure to the current rather than the substrate. Yeah, so... Getting more clues as we go up here. Truly stunning features. I'm going to give you a DVL reset. Um, somebody's asking, how much does the ROV cost? Mm. Oh, well, it's gone through several evolutions and improvements and things. I know that. Mm. And a Dan fan. Dan is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to give my two cents on the the whole adapta adaptation yes. thing. Um, mine is the mantis shrimp. Um, it's a pretty cool little creature that um, punches with the strength of like a 22 caliber. It punches so fast it like vaporizes uh, the immediate water around it. It's pretty cool. Mantis shrimp. I googled it. They're really cool looking. Yeah, it's beautiful. They can see in um, a wide range of uh, wavelengths as well. I used to watch this show called um, Most Extreme Animals, and that was yeah. always about one of them.
this feature almost looks man-made as if it's <laughs> some kind of uh yeah. bridge or something yeah it does i was getting big ice cream sandwich vibes from yeah. this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so we've had pizza boxes yeah. and then yesterday we had um the blooming onion and today we have ice cream sandwiches And it has been about an hour uh, since we last had the lasers on. So could we potentially get some screen time with the lasers on? I don't know if that will interfere with the photogrammetry, but I know we wanted some size reference. Absolutely. So we're on the hour now if we want Yeah, thank you. That's yeah. fantastic. And how long Another should ten. we run those for? Um, let's Kay. go ahead and run bridge, those for... Bridge nav, two zero meters, let's do two one seven minute. five. One minute? Okay. For each one of them. It's not actually going to meaningfully mess up the photogrammetry. Okay. Uh, so I'd prefer to make sure that we hit a good target um, that's, okay. you know, parallel. Okay. You can see those really big bamboo corals sort of stretching off the top of that feature right now. Wow. I'm putting into my highlight, Dyke looks like ice cream sandwich. Yeah, really <laughs> exciting area. Looks like everything in the ocean is really loving this ice cream sandwich dike too. Yeah. yeah it's like it, these for uh, ice cream formations like maximize the uh, wave current and um, food availability for these um, corals. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I like that fuzzy one. <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite. That's an Eritogorgia. Oh, Eritogorgia. Yeah. Also okay. known as a firework coral. Uh, sometimes the um, spirals are more dramatic and visible. Uh, well, if we could truly, get the lasers on. Remarkable. I'm not sure. Yeah, Dan can't hear me. Hold on, I'll, I'll ask him off FSPL. Gives you some scale for the size of this thing. Absolutely. That's yeah, so 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters before between, anyone asks on our. Two green dots. How are these dikes formed, Matty asked. We, we talked a little yeah. about that before. Um, there, there are several ways, but I mean, fundamentally, it's a, a flow of lava wow. that either has come into an existing formation and cracked it apart and you form this thin right. the thin ship flow. moves coming to an end i'm going to wait until you pop um, up and then give you another or there is a you're good now crack that all right a flow will come into and it cools bridge and bridge now it's, it's, it's two zero meters two seven five flow. so it's usually associated with with cracking in an existing formation or creating cracks in a in a formation um, the other way, I think, and I'm, I'm starting to wonder about what we're seeing, because I don't know its orientation with respect to the original volcanism, is you can have a, a lava flow kind of come down horizontally and, and form a, a relatively thin layer, and then that's followed by um, more airborne material and, and what we call hyaloclastics, hyaloclastics that 
form this softer material, so you'll have the hard lava, this more sediment-like material, maybe another flow of hard lava, and then what we might be seeing is the soft stuff is eroded in between, leaving leaving these thin layers, the dikes themselves. Dikes yeah. are usually usually uh, That's gonna be great. vertical when we talk about dikes, but it's hard to know yeah. what the original orientation of these in the were. Fish eye, you can see Atalanta coming into frame. Mm -hmm. Some fantastic driving by our uh, ROV driver. Yeah. <laughs> and then look at the the, the, the baby columnar <laughs> basalt yeah. in the dike itself. It's baby basalt. <laughs> Again, that's just, just nature's nature's way of cooling when it has the time is to do that in that minimum stress relief approach of, of hexagons or pentagons. That's a really cool shot. Yeah, amazing. It's really beautiful to see how the stem just kind of spirals. Yeah. Well, now we're having a competition. For which is more beautiful, the geology or the biology? <laughs> <laughs> we can have our, our viewers vote online. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. what do you guys think? Uh, <laughs> uh, we have it right. Somebody uh, named Jason is really excited about the geology. We're glad you are. That could be our Jason right downstairs. Oh, is it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, it, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it could be. Uh, somebody's asking, when is our next dive? So we're going to dive again here at this location uh, tomorrow. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. That's the plan. And again, with same in, in this dive being a, uh, a dive focused on the photogrammetry, that getting that 3D. Can you, can you talk coverage. a little louder, Larry? Boy, I can't win. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> talk I mean, is it just me or does he sound a little low? I don't <laughs> The viewers want to hear you, Larry. Right. You ready for another move, Dan? Or? Okay. <laughs> Poor Dan has to put plugs in his ears then. Oh, I'll, I'll give you a minute. He's criticized right. for being too loud yep. before. <laughs> um, so the next dive, we'll be hit back here tomorrow. Today's dive is uh, focused on photogrammetry, getting that uh, three-dimensional coverage. I might switch you back to USB wide angle solutions uh, here. Reconstruction. We're having DBL tracking and, again. And uh, tomorrow's issues. dive will be focused on this immersion. All right, I'm going to switch you back to USB a, a, for a while. Somewhat more narrow view but really high resolution that, that can be used for things, uh, immersion theaters and, and real outreach events like that. And, and boy, I can imagine this will look spectacular. We've had those lasers on for a while. Do we need to keep them going or can we give them a break? Okay. Jonathan, you comfortable with the lasers? Enough time yep. with the lasers? Okay. Sure. Dan, if we could secure the laser, lasers. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I love that Atalant view there with Herc sitting right above the dike. Oh, man. Yeah, I get so focused on watching the satellite feed one, but the feed two really gives yep. you a scale for everything here, yeah, just no, how big a, it is. That's a beautiful eye in the sky perspective. Right? Yeah, some of those corals, you can really see like just how big they are when Herc is next to them. All right. Bridge, bridge nav, two zero meters, two seven five. Hey Dan, I'm not sure if you can like lateral left a little bit to see the r right hand. Over the edge on the, is that what you're trying to see? Yeah, hey Dan, I'm not sure if you get lateral left a little so we can kind of see over the other edge. Yeah. Left. Yeah. Yep. That left. Yep. 
Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, if you just hug that ridge, see the fish eyes are getting both sides at the same time. Wow. Yeah. And so we're up, we're up uh, a little over 100 meters from where we started. Already? Uh, yep, 110, 120 meters. We're 1290 now. We started a little over 1400. You can really see that selective habitat use again with the, uh, you know, so on the. Yeah, did you want them to. This individual. You don't rocks, see it anymore uh, in your Zeus cam. <laughs> and so, you see that. No more crinoids, but you know, very, very, very little life here Did where the dike isn't protruding, protruding above what's on either side of it. Got to do that. Look at that. Yeah, definitely. I'll just stop there, huh? No, yeah, you got to actually click vehicle. For a structurally Atlanta. complex um, or structures. Or Argus and there you go. Do that one. You just always do Argus and yeah, there you go. Oh yeah. Well, looks like maybe there's a little bit more sediment here. Perhaps that could be in interfering a bit with some of the things trying to live on the bottom. Looks like another, maybe perhaps another slide feature here. Ooh. It, it keeps changing on me. It like randomly jumps back and forth between the grid sizes. Wow. Yeah, I really appreciate getting this, um, these kind of different views. It's going to work well for the photogrammetry. That moves over. You ready another one? Bridge, bridge nav, two zero meters, two seven zero. Wow, look at that topography. Incredibly complex. There we go again. Wow. Slow them. Oh, slow the moves too. All right, slow speed. Yeah. Bridge, bridge nav. Can we decrease our speed uh, 0 0.2? That is really cool looking. Seeing everything along these uh, ridge lines, it looks like where they uh, site wind farms and everything, like all the <laughs> turbines, how they'd all line up on that high ground. Yeah. So for those of you that are just joining us, we're looking at this really cool dike and all the organisms that are growing on it. Um, and we're imaging it with triclops. Yeah, that's 
pretty cool. Mm. Well, that all lined up on the egg. <laughs> Alec, could you define what a dike is? Sure, so. a dike is a uh, thin, often vertical, solid bit of lava. You can see one of them sticking out just right now. They're usually formed uh, during Hercules. an eruption when uh, the magma will go into a crack or will create a crack. Um, so you don't get a massive uh, lava uh, lava flow that eventually hardens. Uh, that would make something what, what we call a volcanic plug, but instead you get these thin, and, and this is probably, you know, if I, I'm remembering the, the lasers, I would say that's probably two or three meters, maybe in terms of uh, width. So yeah, you can almost six, see it in relation to Hercules there. Right, yeah, so six, 10, 12 feet maybe wide. And they're usually not just one, they're usually a, a series of them. We call them dike swarms. Um, and again, they'll represent either the fracturing of the rock that was originally there, or the material that was, the formation that was originally there, um, or the creation of, of cracks. Um, Ready for another, Dan? In, in the formation that was there. Bridge, bridge now, or two zero two seven five. existing faults and cracks that were there. Point two. And I think in these cases here, you see the softer material that was on either side of the dike, and that's been eroded. And so the dike stands up like this. If the dike is very hard, the solid basalt, but the, the, the softer material to either side is, is eroded. Travis or Ignacio, do you know um, if these fans we are seeing are bamboo or pronoid fans? I know that the whips we're seeing are bamboo whips, but I can't quite tell. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure either, okay. especially from this distance. Yeah. But cool. we can take a look at our our guides here. I think these are crinoids. So yeah, so those are crinoids, yeah. but the like this white coral fan there off to yeah. the left. Right. I'm not sure if that's a bamboo or a primnoid. But the majority of things we're seeing are crinoids. Yes, yeah. yeah They're definitely so dominating this area. Right, and what we're noticing is they, they tend to sit right on the highest point, on the edges, right? maybe not even the highest point, but the edges of, of the dikes or the formation that's standing up because these are all filter feeders. They, they pick up their sustenance from material carried in the currents and if you have a current going by, the best place to intercept it is going to be on the edge of a feature like this, because that current will get blocked by the, that feature and give the organism a chance to extract the nutrition it wants there. If you're down at the base, you'd be sheltered from the current. Okay. And the texture of the rock is super cool. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I like that rock. <laughs> Very neat, yeah. That is a nice boulder. Well, you talk about sensory overload. There's so many monitors up here. You don't know which one to watch. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> yeah, I can close my eyes, wow. though, you can't. <laughs> I've learned you have to be pretty patient with geologists. They all have their faults. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 we all know Well one. played. Good one. <laughs> Well, Jonathan, if videography doesn't work out, you can always be a comedian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're a, a, an announcer. You have a very good announcer voice. <laughs> Definitely I, be in the documentary. So I'm, re I'm reading the, uh, the notes from the Pisces dive in 2011, and um, they found their 
first strike at 1,252 meters. That's just about where we are now, but we've obviously seen them for, for at least uh, seven Ready for another meters dam? deeper than that. Right, it's always bridge, a bridge nav. Problem two zero, from any two of these seven kinds five. of explorations, you get such a narrow, narrow view, particularly out of a submersible window. We get a much wider field of view here. But even even at that, it's still relatively limited by the the distance that light will travel, which is not very far in water. Oh wow! Have our look first at, look, uh, at, look at how steep that is. Uh, uh, Anthemastis, or also known as mushroom coral, in the center of the yellow. Wow! Yeah, look at yeah, that. Yeah, the stalked That's organism. Really pretty. Whoa, polyps. So it's each like one of those is a polyp there, mm -hmm. and it will use that polyp to feed. Those polyps are huge. Right? Huge. Did I call it a palm tree? Oh, that's a palm tree coral. Yeah. That's a good view of her. It does look like a palm huge. tree. Huge. <laughs> wow. Now, Dan. Yeah, we got right. If, if you dip out, no, I don't want you to do this, I just, but if, if Hercules could kind of look over the edge and see how far it is. And how high is that feature? You know, you, if you yeah. Can get a, you can get a altimeter reading. I'll go look if you, if you don't want to turn your eyes away. So now you're about 4.8 wow. oh, meters off color. the feature. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. And that's a hemichoralium right there, that pink coral. Mm. It's a new species we haven't seen on this dive yet. And I can't tell what those white fuzzy blobs are, if they're urchins or sponges. I can't tell. <laughs> have to get closer. Yeah. They yeah, look a little big to be an urchin. And for our viewers out there, um, in the deep sea, um, yeah. many species that are filter feeders or um, okay. I don't, I don't interrupt um, this, they get their pigmentation from what they eat. So and it's this uh, specific pigment called carotenoids, it's kind of like what you um, are in orange, uh, I mean carrot peels. Mm. Oh, 10 at that point. Oh, well, maybe higher than that. 13? Yeah, so I, I would guess 10 meters high because you're, you're above it now. Look at that big hunk of rock. Yeah. <laughs> How'd that get there? I think there's a lag between the altimeter reading and uh, yeah. Someone okay. was suggesting ah, that they're okay. white urchins. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but I haven't seen any in my guide quite that large. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that they look like urchins with the one we passed, but. Um, and a viewer is asking, is this the pinnacle that was mentioned earlier? <laughs> yeah, I think we're all wondering what they meant by the pinnacles, whether the, the, <laughs> there, are, there are two very, very large <laughs> Ready for another move here. there, Dan? No, that yeah. Those could be the pinnacles, or was bridge, there something? Bridge, now. Uh, two zero sure meters, know, but, but two seven zero. A pinnacle-like feature, the larger feature yeah. that we're... we're Oh wow, this is this is certainly looking more pinnacle. <laughs> yeah, here's a pinnacle. Look at that. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you got wow. Still 20 meters behind. So let me know. I can give you a stop if you need. A viewer is asking if there's an underwater volcano near here called 
Loihi. Yeah. 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 Loihi. So, so the Hawaiian Islands are quite amazing. They, they represent a series of islands that were created as the Pacific Plate, the tectonic plate, moved over what we call a hot spot. You know, normally, we form new ocean crust at, at rich crust, um, and that's kind of this beginning of this conveyor belt of, of plate tectonics. Uh, but every once in a while, there are places out in the middle of the plate that for some reason have concentrated lots of, lots of heat and create magma um, deep in the mantle. And that stays stationary while the plate moves over it. So if you look at the Hawaiian island chain, um, starting with the far western islands, um, they are basically describing the trend of that plate as it moved over. Think of it like a Bunsen burner that was just sitting in one spot. And as the plate moved over, it would heat it up and you get a volcano. And then it would move on and you heat it up and you get another volcano. Now that is cool. Very, very neat. And so uh, the, the most recent of the islands, which is still erupting, is the big island where we are right now. And so that there's still active um, active eruptions going on. Um, we were at uh, Molokai yesterday. That's probably about two million years old. So two million years ago, it was over that hot spot. Uh, Oahu, maybe four million years ago. But Loihi is the next one coming. So the next Hawaiian island, next Hawaiian island is going to be Loihi. It just oh, hasn't wow. come to the surface yet. So yeah. So there is active uh, volcanism going on there, and it's a it's a a growing island. Uh, a viewer is asking, what kind of forces would it take to break apart a dike? Big ones. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard rock. Uh, it's yeah, vol ignis. yeah, volcanoes are very, very powerful, and, and the, the power of, of, of magma coming into it can melt the rock and then just start cracking it. Yeah, so it, it, it's, a, it's a, an amazingly forceful um, event. And there are often earthquakes associated with the movement of magmas and things like that. And actually, that's how oftentimes uh, eruptions are are predicted, or, or that you get warnings for um, the eruption of volcanoes by having lots of very sensitive uh, seismometers, earthquake uh, monitoring devices around the volcano. And the first thing they'll start to see is uh, magma moving through dikes. And, or creating dikes. Yeah, look, little little kilometer basalt here, and um, that'll be the first warnings that things are going to happen. Certainly, it was the case with uh, the Big Island. Well, you know all the old saying, Larry. Igneous is bliss. Oh, Jonathan, <laughs> Jonathan, Jonathan. <laughs> Ready for another Dan? Bridge, bridge and F, two zero two seven zero. We're coming up on the hour. If you want to do your lasers again, I don't know. It's, yeah, wait, just wait till yeah. the hour. We'll do this quite. Uh, yeah. Nice and flat.
Yeah, leaving the lasers on for a minute um, seems to be good. Thank you. Hi, Amy. We are currently at about 1,200 meters depth. We have some very impressed viewers that are really liking the geology. I mean, geology is pretty <laughs> cool. Now we're starting to see more corals and less crinoids. Mm -hmm. Not a super high density of corals, but. Uh, yes, sir. They are. Oh yeah, they're they're pulsating on the iframe. Do you see that? Oh, the other thing, it, it looks juttery because um, I'm running a very high shutter speed for the photos right now, so it's not as naturally pleasing. It's not in cinema mode. For the camera geek in the world that might be listening to this or anyone interested in it, the convention for movie formats for the shutter speed of your camera, so how long the shutter is open for when you're taking an image We're just is finishing up this movie, ready for called a 180 degree shutter. And what that means Three, is that two, zero, two, uh, seven, for a 30 zero. frame per second shoot, so where you're, you're taking 30 frames per second uh, for, for a piece of film, um, your shutter is open for half of that time. And so, again, for a, a movie that would traditionally be shown at, at like 30 frames per second, um, your shutter speed would be 1 60th of a second, so half of the frame rate. <laughs> and if you actually took a photo at 1 60th of a second and you are moving fast, it would actually be blurred. You'd see motion blur in there, but um, that is what your eye expects to see. And if you pause most movies, you'll see that that frame is usually blurry where actors are moving quickly through the scene. And But when it's actually played back at your 30 frames per second, your, your eye doesn't perceive that. It feels natural. Um, and that's, that's called the 180 degree rule. And um, you can break that rule like anything in cinematography, and, and you can run a faster shutter speed. And a, a great example of that was uh, the fight scenes in Gladiator. And in the fight scenes in Gladiator, in most action scenes, they actually throw it up to a faster shutter speed. So they'll do a 90 degree shutter. And at, um, you know, when you're shooting then at a faster shutter speed of like 1 90th of a second, um, it makes the scene feel choppier, and and it matches the movement of of a, of a big action sequence like that, and it makes your body, your mind, the viewers perceiving it as a much more jittery uh, experience, and and it helps kind of build the, the the emotion of the moment. So that's why for this style of filming, I mean, you you're viewing it out on channel three right now the images coming off of Triclops, you might notice that in fact, it looks like it's strobing a little bit. It looks almost choppy. And that's because the objective of this cruise, instead of it being fine cinematography, uh, or this dive fine cinematography, in fact, it's for photogrammetry. I'm running the shutter speed much higher than you would if you were filming. Um, so that is the art and the science behind shutter speed and, and, and why it can feel juttery or buttery smooth. <laughs> so Jonathan, are you okay with the uh, lasers now? Enough of the lasers? Or? Yes, sir. Fine. Okay. So then we secure, oh, maybe you have secured the lasers. Thank you. So what's this big hunk of rock here? What's that doing there? Yeah, I was just noticing that. So sometimes in a in a lava flow, lava the lava will pick off a bit of the host rock. It's called a xenolith, meaning 
kind of a firing rock. Mm -hmm. So it could be that. It's interesting that there's not a high density of life there, even though it's higher up in the water column. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that they prefer the edges of those dikes that we've seen so far. Well, I think they, once, with the long dike, they have more of a chance, I think, of uh, than just a, a single little feature sitting out there. Yeah. Mm. Okay, coming up. I'm going to go run down to the data lab okay. for a moment. This all right. is all set up in nominal mode. Okay, so we're just... Yep. We're just moving up. We're yep, I'll be down in the up. data lab if you need me. All right, great. Fantastic Thanks, flying, Dan. Thank you. Keep on. All right. I know. Jonathan's going to go process some data, mm. make some magic 3D uh, visualizations of what we've been seeing, mm. which should be uh, Dan, our move's done. I don't know if you want me to move just yet. Um, so the yeah, question the about the types of cameras... It. Jonathan just bridge, left. Bridge he will be back. Two zero two seven zero. The only thing I know is that they are Z cam cameras. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yes. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Correct. They are Z cam cameras, yeah. and uh, all three of them, uh, two different models. One's a Z cam Pro, and the others are just uh, Z cam. The uh, center one and the cinema cameras, uh, Z Cam Pro. Little fancier lens. So about 1182 meters now. So we're working our way up. The peak is on the order of, uh, Chris, about 800 meters. Uh, you mean at the at the top? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think those definitely are urchins. I can see a little uh, bit more of the structure uh, there. Urchins. Where do you see urchins? Uh, the, the they've been these white blobs oh, that we've white been seeing. Blob. Yeah. I couldn't quite make out their spines and their structure, but that was a little bit more clear after seeing a couple of them. Once I finally learned to put a crono, a crino, a crino, I can't say that. Crinoid looks like. And all I see is crinoids. So. Yeah. Mostly so you crinoids. See this uh, these, these kind of shoots, you see there's clearly uh, stuff moving down slope here in, the, in these shoots that are, appear to be happening in between the dikes. And that's probably the stuff being eroded, eroded out. So I think the, the question that the volcanologists would know the answer to is whether that represented the original host rock when the dike was in place, or is it just a series of a lava flow and then more of the ash fall and the mm -hmm. softer stuff and lava flow. That, that often happens in these eruptions. Ooh, what's that? Oh, a dead spongy? or a fallen sponge, yeah. Yeah, a spongy thing. That was, that Looks was like we're having some looking. fallout yeah. here. Huh. Some falling rocks, mm -hmm. potentially. Teleran, if you know, things like crinoids, they produce, they have a polyp stage, and that, does that kind of float in the water and they find a place to settle on? You know, I'm not too sure about their their life cycle structure, yeah. but yeah, I believe I believe that's that's correct. Um, like uh, other echinoderms. Mm -hmm. Uh, viewers asking, what was the shallowest expedition that y'all have been on? Ooh, I think uh, uh, right Bob on and the I beach. were on one in the Channel <laughs> Islands where I remember uh, we kind of backed uh, Hercules up to a cave and we could watch it the whole time. <laughs> we could see what was going on. <laughs> we were right next to the shore, in essence. So that was, that was pretty shallow. <laughs> Dan, what about you? Uh, I've beached uh, several ROVs where we had to get out of the boat and go push them back off the... Uh, okay, well, <laughs> that, that, wow. that probably beats, beats ours. <laughs> Pretty shallow, yeah. Um, so almost all crinoids, crinoids developed by um, lycidotrophic larvae, short-lived non-feeding planktonic larvae, um, and some crinoids that are 
benthic that will not move, that grow on that stalk, uh, then, then that's how they'll stay for the rest of their life and then they'll feed in the water column by filter feeding. Ready for one more dam? Yep. Bridge, bridge now. 20270. Zero, zero. Um, there's a viewer saying that maybe uh, there's not so much life because Kilauea has been active, but not currently. Um, and there's been earthquakes. So, would earthquakes affect these organisms? Good question. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think, I, no, I, I, I would think not, really. You I, you know, no? Know, un unless it was happening, uh, come down you know, for an earthquake and, a, a, and some kind of tsunami. Or going out of the box here. Yeah, just, you know, I can currents. barely hear you, Larry. What? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm oh, <man>. sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a lot quieter. Who yeah. do I drown out? Who do I don't? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think organisms like this, unless there's, you know, we're right at the, the place where there was the motion or there was an underwater landslide or something caused by the earthquake, I, I, yeah. I couldn't imagine that an earthquake would uh, really impact these kinds of organisms. It could create lots of, with lots of volcanism, it could yeah. create areas where there's flows and things like that. Um, but I, I think we're, we're not seeing really modern terrain here we're, we're seeing okay. stuff you know. Taylor and help me out what well, I'm that, having that, a yeah blank. just to, to build on that a little bit with on with the, any uh, uh, ecological communities it all depends on sort of the frequency of the disturbances so in this What's case that? you're talking about you know disturbances from earthquakes and oh uh, no I was asking yeah, Taylor and for a idea there I'm Larry there is like the earthquake name. itself probably doesn't affect many of these very much but I'm any uh, landslides could certainly scour the surface and remove any uh, organisms from that. But also you have to remember we're in the deep sea, so there's not a lot of food coming down here. Things grow very slowly. Um, and so, you know, even though it doesn't look like there's a lot of life, there's, you know, some of these organisms could be quite old. And so that would indicate that there hasn't been a huge disturbance here. Uh, that's really negatively been impacting these communities uh, for some amount of time. But to can, uh, really up, address that, we would need to, yeah, find some ages on these. So some of the bamboo corals, at least, that were really tall, uh, those tend to grow really slow. And scientists can actually collect those and, and look at Cycle your changes in uh, uh, sort uh, of counting the tree off, rings yeah. uh, of those so corals. Travis, that's how you date uh, uh, the, the, the corals, by counting rings on them? Yeah, so a lot of our work's been in uh, shallow corals, and you have very distinct uh, annual bands. So you have a high-density, low-density band, and those pair up and give you a year. Uh, and so, you, yeah, you're, it's literally like tree rings, counting back in time. And I think the bamboo corals, they grow co certainly much, much slower. What's, uh, a, what's a typical age for a coral? What's the life expectancy of a coral? Oh. For bamboo corals, you know, some of the ones I've seen, I'm not so sure. A lot of the shallow corals that we work with, um, you know, a large colony, um, large, I guess, is a, is a relative term, but, you know, if there was one the size of a car, that could be hundreds of years old. Um, and, you know, so basically tens of years up to hundreds of years. Um, if you sort of look at your arm, sort of from your elbow down, for many corals, that? that's about you know 50 years of growth. Really? Okay. Um, and again, we're here in the deep sea, so we don't have that photosynthesis powerhouse for calcification like we do in shallow waters. Uh, and so things tend to grow a lot slower. And, and instead of forming these big, massive boulders, we have sort of long, skinny stalks. Um, and that's one of the you know big concerns right, with, moves finish there, Danny. You with things like black corals. Um, you want you know, a minute? Harvested to be made for jewelry and things like that, but you know it literally takes hundreds of years to Same. grow that skeleton, and ready. so you have to be very careful, you know, in terms of bridge, bridge uh, folks harvesting two zero, that, two so that you're zero. you're not just dis destroying those uh, those communities. We don't have the lasers on, do we? It's not, that's a jelly. It's a jelly that has yeah. long tentacles here. Yeah. You see, yeah. I thought there were lasers. Did anyone see if there's any view of that from Atalanta? 
No, I can't see. Too much yeah. The tentacles are very right. fine. But it's, it's right in the now. center of the... Relay that hold position. Oh, wow. Very cool. It's like a it's balloon. Like a flo yeah, but yeah. say floating balloon. <laughs> I really got to get better at my jellies. Wow. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've seen this one before. Going through our guides. Looks like one of those Macy's Day parade <laughs> balloons <laughs> broke free. It's just drifting. Especially with those long sort of strands coming off of it. Looks like it's being held uh, held down, doesn't it? Somebody commented, slow growing corals need stability. Crinoids, oops, crinoids and urchins don't. Well, that makes per perfect sense. So. Um, and Larry, um, somebody is asking about the geologic features and how does basalt form into perfect geometric long cubes. Um, do you want to talk about that again? Yeah, um, they're not necessarily cubes, although they can be. For the most part, these columns we see are um, hexagons or pentagons. And that really has to do with um, the way which, uh, in general, in nature, things cool and they try to relieve stress. And um, as the lava starts to cool, if it's allowed to cool quite slowly, it'll start contracting and it does it kind of equally in all directions and it pulls away and it cracks and that crack propagate, propagates down and we get these uh, remarkable um, columns that are, again, mostly hexagonal or pentagonal shape. Sometimes they're, they're four-sided, sometimes they're even triangular. But for the most part, it's uh, hexagons and pentagons. And I, I mentioned yesterday that that same phenomena happens when uh, mud dries. And we often see mud cracks uh, if you're in a, a desert area. And those mud cracks will often have hexagons or pentagons. And Sorry, what was that, Dan? Uh, did someone get a highlight of the jelly spin there? Uh, yes. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And um, if you see uh, other things, okay, we'll, we'll try to tent. form that, that stress-relieving shape. Ready for that move? Yeah, now, in, yeah, in sure. nature, sometimes <laughs> things are easily okay. form Confidence, I cubic like it. shapes, things like bridge, salt crystals, bridge, nav, two zero, because two there's zero. something we call cleavage. It's the way the, the, the uh, ions uh, align, the atoms align. Um, but that's not the case with basalt. It's not a cleavage. Uh, it, it's not a. It's not part of its natural mineral structure that that mm. creates that. It's really this uh, this cooling phenomenon. And somebody's asking if we're going to collect any samples. No, th our purpose for these dives is really um, the collecting of the imagery, and so uh, we want to get a continuous a continuous traverse up the up the slope, so we're not going to stop for samples on this dive. But that is one of the big things that's really cool about this technology is that it allows us to fully reconstruct this entire slope and bring it back into the lab. And uh, Ignacio here will be spending many, many months uh, <laughs> analyzing <laughs> this incredible uh, transect of, of data we're pulling apart. Um, so it's yeah, completely you know non-invasive, and we can fully reconstruct everything, and then share that, and you know create scientific knowledge, but also uh, create really interesting visuals to help bring the deep sea, uh, you know, out out of the ocean and and out to the public, so that everyone gets a chance to experience it through some of these other types of immersive technologies. And here's a beautiful example of uh, the crinoids and the corals saying, "I need a hard rock." To to sit on, um, that you see them just where just where the outcrop is. Yeah, absolutely, and we see that repeating, you know, over and over at this dive. That come down fine for me. That preference for that hard substrate. Yeah, we might be able to put this um, once we digitize this and create a virtual reconstruction. We could probably put this on Sketchfab, and have our viewers. Um, um, virtually walk along this uh, terrain that we've been um, uh, measuring. Someone asked, is it possible that a volcano could make a massive lava tube that is big enough for an entire ship or bigger? Maybe they like a 
well, an ROV? I, I, I've been in lava tubes in Iceland uh, that might not fit this ship, but they're quite, <laughs> quite large. They get, they're, uh, they're certainly uh, all 30, 40, 50, 50 feet, I would guess, uh, in diameter. You certainly can walk in them very easily. And uh, I, 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 It's like the ripples are pointing to where uh, it's a good ideal habitat for these organisms to, to settle. Well, the um, ripples uh, in the indicate water the current yeah, direction. Down and, another and, five for me. And uh, being, being in that current direction is a good place to be if you're one of these yeah. critters. It's very interesting. Uh, it doesn't, yeah, like look like too thick of a sediment layer. I know oh. If you're logging back there, we're going to do this little ridge in reverse. Okay. But even with that little bit of sediment, it's only on the rocks that these guys, even just a, a single little rock sitting there, that's where, that's where they'll uh, attach. Yeah. And it looks like we have sort of, we're going along a little bit of an inflection point mm -hmm. here yep. where Come up. Up, 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 up over to our right, looks like a little flatter and a little mm -hmm. bit more filled with sediment and sort of down the slope, we'd have a little bit more exposed rocks. So it'll be interesting to see if that continues moving up. Come up and look down if you can. actually getting deeper. Uh, I turned around just to do a 180 on oh this okay. little ridge line here. And this, I was waiting for the boat. And Jonathan had <coughs> requested the an occasional swing around. Yeah. Which I immediately denied, but I thought I would. Uh, well, I I, uh, <laughs> I I also told them. <laughs> it depends, you know. Sometimes we can, sometimes yeah. we. Uh, so I said we were all getting set up and getting ready to start climbing. We didn't start the need swinging around at that point. I happened to be waiting for the boat there. I was yeah. well, stretched out. out. I'm sure that's much appreciated then. Our move is done, by the way, Dan. Roger. Uh, I was waiting for the boat. Now the boat's waiting for me. Okay. Let me all uh, turn and burn here. So if we look at these little columns, you can get an idea of which way this was oriented when it when it cooled. You know, because we we've seen the columns. And come up another from five. Vertical. Will I come under you, please. Oh, this is a, an interesting question. Would the recent volcanic activity add acids and minerals in the local waters and affect life down there? I would, well, again, um, I, I don't think we're in a spot right here where there's been this very recent, I mean, the last few years kind of activity, but I would suspect that when there is activity like that, it certainly can. There's certainly um, subaerially, uh, uh, you know, on land when there's volcanic eruptions, you get all kinds of uh, dangerous uh, gases being produced. And uh, there's no reason why that wouldn't happen underwater. We go into solution, so it may not distribute as far, but I'm sure it can have some, some very local effects. Ready, Chris. Say again? Ready, ready. Ready. Just to build on that too, there's some Three really nice now. examples two, zero, from two, seven, elsewhere zero. in the Pacific Ocean of uh, some of these um, undersea volcanoes that are putting out uh, essential minerals like trace iron. And folks have looked at mapping out those iron concentrations and seen sort of these hot spots, these clouds of elevated iron spreading very far away. Uh, from that, that initial point, so sort of hundreds of kilometers, you can see sort of this signal of little extra minerals in the water. So it certainly depends on yeah, what's erupting, where, where that water's going, and uh, how well mixed it is. Uh, All right, I think, I think the, the, the question here was wondering, you know, can it be caustic and, and basically uh, do harm to local organisms and I suspect close enough it could and as you move further away probably not although you know the, the contrast to that of course is in hydrothermal vents where 
these amazingly hot fluids are coming up and you have a whole community that's learned to adapt to it. Yeah, and, and so like, you know, especially seawater, like good to remember that seawater is slightly basic. So uh, on the pH scale, it's usually around 8.1, a little bit lower in the deep sea. And, and so what that means is that there's buffering capacity within the salts of the water to neutralize some of that acid too. So, you know, certainly the, the any footprint of acidification from some kind of eruption would be yep, would like to be very minimal, good, very small, yeah, very localized. And oh, that is really cool looking. Oh. Little jelly. Hello. A tina four, is it? Yeah, it looks like a tina four. It's a red tina four. Red dragon. I think. I think I'm pretty sure it's tina four. It's got a nice little uh, manipulator hanging down there. We're seeing a slight increase of these rock pens too when we com come along these flat uh, sheet flow tops. Um, what's cool about the rock pens and, uh, is they have that uh, peduncle that is modified to be able to uh, perch on the rock rather than... Say that uh, word again? Peduncle? <laughs> peduncle. <laughs> so it's like kind of essentially you make the foot. That <laughs> no, I didn't, but it is a fun word to say. Yeah. It um, is a fun word to hear as well. <laughs> Brings back memories, huh, Taylor? Right? Yeah, most sea pens like to... Uh, or are able to uh, hold on another. into the soft sediment onto a small piece of rock Bridge, or just, Bridge, it's two zero yeah, two usually two buried in zero. sediment, not on top of uh, a large piece of rock like this. What is this here? So what is this? Oh, here? it's like a bone. Wow. It does. Yeah. Oh. All right, let's Whoa. see if we can take a little closer look at this. Right, right on top correct, of this Bridge. one. And look at, yeah, you can see the scale of the size in Atlanta view. Very large. I'm going to, uh, before I do a circle here, I'm just going to turn on the lasers for a minute. Yep. I'll put the lasers right on it, and then we'll do a, uh, we'll play around here and do a uh, 360 around it. Once the, uh, uh, once this next move is complete, we'll have Atlanta right on top of us, and I can, yeah, yeah. We're going to hang here for a minute, I believe. Is it a bone or a piece of it's a a wood, wood? A piece of wood or a bone? Uh, let's get the lasers to get an idea of the size. Be a good uh, photogrammetry. Uh, yep. Yeah, wow. Well, I don't know. What do you think? Is it worth worth it? We have yep. time. Yep. I'd say so. Yep. Yeah. Let's check it out. We'll do a. Uh, a real close pass, and then I'll mm -hmm. do a, uh, while we're waiting for the boat, and then I'll do a fly over at once. And that is really cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing a tree trunk, but I don't know. We're trying to figure out if it's a whalebone or a tree trunk. Maybe it's a petrified tree. You see that white powdery yep. stuff associated yeah. with it again.
there is a squat lobster on top of it. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah there is. When you're done with your photogrammetry spin, if you can get a real tight zoom, we can see what the intern, you know, what the cellular structure is. And somebody might know whether that represents a wood or bone. Yeah. Look at the uh, cinema cameras actually looking under it. Yeah. You see that. You see there's been boring in there, so it could be wood borers or bone borers. Yeah, the side of it looks more wood-like. Yeah, it looks definitely looking more That ship moves, Danny, you want me to hold up for a second? Yes, yeah, please. I'm going to fly around this thing a few times. And it looks like a foot and a leg. over it. <laughs> <laughs> From fallen, this angle. Fallen giant. Yeah, it's a giant leg. No. Oh, I'm surprised that it has this curvature, mm -hmm. right? Very interesting shape, yeah. <laughs> it does sort of have that, that same sort of curve as a lot of like coastal palm trees mm. tend to have that are kind mm -hmm. of growing near the water. It's so, a good point. Um, yeah, perhaps that's where, where our mystery came from. I don't really see much evidence of, of big branches or anything like that either. But uh, certainly hard to tell. Taylor, on your still capture, you're like, cannot be determined. And I put mm -hmm. on my bone, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I was racing to type something more, <laughs> I probably would have done the same thing. Yeah, I don't want to wait to find out what it really is and then miss the highlight. <sighs> Whatever it is, it is fascinating. Yeah. Um, some it yeah. doesn't belong here. <laughs> yeah, somebody's uh, writing in. Um, if it's bone, would the sediment be more disturbed from sea creatures crawling around and eating it? Yeah, if it was bone, I would expect to see more organisms feeding on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, unless it was covered in something that would not allow them to do that. But my guess so far is uh, is not bone, but wood. Even though I really want it to be a bone, that would be yeah. cool. <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> I got to be a little farther away on the uphill side here to get it in the uh, cameras. Someone said elephant tusk. Just kidding. <laughs> um, and somebody else says a long ways from land for a tree trunk. Well, there no, there's an island. We could see an island from the ship. Yeah, not so far. Yeah. And. And floating trees can actually cover quite a bit of distance before they're sinking. Uh, for example, that's uh, the islands of the Galapagos. It's thought that uh, rafting trees and things like that were uh, some of the things that delivered life to the islands. And they are exceptionally far from the coast of South America. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, wood floats quite a while. Yeah, I I'd, I'd imagine that um, that piece of wood right now is like supporting a, like a high a high degree of um, bacterial diversity right now, just breaking it down.
if you could if you could zoom real close in and see if we can see the structure. Yeah, I'll, uh, set it down here and uh, I'm gonna zoom. There's two people writing in. Uh, is it possible, possibly part of a ship, or could it be part of an old boat? Well, it's quite isolated as a single, a single piece. Yeah, the single piece to me seems kind of more likely to be a, a one-off than mm -hmm. a part of something big, which would be the same as thinking about a ship versus thinking about a, a whale. Um, but certainly things can get scattered across the seafloor. Uh, I suspect people will know they will take a look at this kind of imagery and, and, yeah. and, and, and say pretty clearly. The fine control of the ROV makes it seem as if we're on level with the with the wood. Yeah. Okay, video, can you uh, zoom in there for us? Yeah, I'm gonna guess that's wood-like. Certainly looks woody, doesn't yeah. it? I mean, you can just kind of see the grain and. Yep. I can imagine sanding that up would be a nice thing. <laughs> Congratulations on this monumental discovery of wood. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Big team effort. I did lots of highlights for you, Jonathan. We, yeah. we, we blame it on KK. Most incredible piece of wood this he, is going to be. He, he, he told us sure. it was a submarine. <laughs> okay, you can go away, thanks. <laughs> if you guys are happy back there. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, chunk of wood recorded in 27k. Yes. <laughs> so I went, uh, well, you know, wood falls are interesting too. I went all the way around it and flew over it in both directions, so I expect a 3D print by the end of my watch. <laughs> you could, Jonathan, you, you, you heard the, an great, audience. The, the great mystery and then uh, not yeah. solved until the zoom. <laughs> yeah. If you're listening right now, we'll get this up on uh, Sketchfab by the end of the night. <laughs> that way you can 3D print yeah. your own custom. You too. Right. This could be our souvenir. Yeah. A 3D printed souvenir. Yeah. <laughs> Forget those silly columns of rock. Uh, somebody's asking what uh, what it what those are on the slim end of it. Uh, the crinoids. Couple on top? crinoids. Yeah. 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 Three crinoids. Yeah. And then there's a squat lobster there, lobster on the right hand side near the curve. That white oh, yeah. speck. That's funny. Quick shot of the squatty before we go on the way. It'll add to the, the 3D model of this piece of wood. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully Jonathan's not mad at us. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a, uh, just a quick flying zoom for us there. Place it out. You got to. Uh, you're gonna have to uh, do your own model of squat lobster to go on your 3D print. There, <laughs> so. Okay. Thank you. All right. Away we go. Ready for that move there? Yes. Sir. Bridge. Bridge. Nav. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two zero two eight zero. Ship's gone all the way up this hill backwards. Keep forgetting to. Ah, uh, you can come back around and look to the west. I think. I think. The branch. Oh, I got more.
All right, we found ourselves some cool rocks again. <laughs> <laughs> Back on the rocks. I like hedgerows. <laughs> Wanna let you write a little more for me? Thanks. Let you write a little more. Yeah, sometimes you gotta cycle it, it gets uh, stuck on silly. This is a, this is a really good uh, example here. See how the, the lava flow came around? That's kind of, that's gotta be a piece of the, the host rock. Oh yeah. And it's taking it with it. Very cool. Oh. That is neat. And a fish. That is neat. So much for photogrammetry for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Never gonna let him live it down. <laughs> yep, headed west. Very good for another move. You want, Chris? Bridge, bridge nav, two zero two eight zero. It's just so cute. They're just, they're like, I like this spot. This is where I want to be. Nowhere else. And they all <laughs> line up. <laughs> Looks like a a very eroded dike just sticking out of the surface. Yeah, there. yeah. they're basically lining up where the or yeah. just barely outcropping. And you can actually see that too if you you go for a hike and you're in the woods around you. Like you'll often see features like that where you'll see like a strip of plants or trees that are very different from the others. And actually, if you dig in the soil there, it's often because there's a, a different rock feature underneath. Down five. Mm. So pretty interesting to see the parallels between uh, on land and in the ocean. Yeah. But yeah, really striking in this picture, just yeah. a straight line yeah. there. And you can see the, the slightly darker color too. Same as our, our main dike features. We're doing uh, one of the 180 ones again. Backtracking. Two angles. Is that a question or Roger. a statement? <laughs> Seems uh, to be a statement. Yeah, yep. I think a statement. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. That reminds me when I was in uh, field camp in Wyoming, you could actually map the chemistry of the outcrop, whether it was silicate or carbonate, by the nature of the lichen that were on it. Some had, you know, I've got which one, one of them had green lichen and one of them had orange lichen. And mm -hmm. so here you can, you can map your geology just by the distribution of the the crinoids. Yes, please.
Yeah, and for our viewers back home, I think these, this commentary, I think, is uh, hopefully really helpful for those of you interested in the sciences, just to see um, there's such a strong interaction between uh, the biology, the chemistry, and the geology. And so even if you're focusing on one of those areas, there's, you know, all of these things are, are very much so connected. Uh, and the same, there's parallels between the deep sea and on land. So uh, really cool things to think about. Yeah. Yeah, but the reality, Travis, is the rocks control all. <laughs> <laughs> the geologist speaking. <laughs> It looks like they're standing in line waiting for something. <laughs> like they're forming a queue. Yeah. <laughs> they are. They're waiting to be fed. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think that's one of the things that's really striking with, with this dive, too, and uh, sometimes we're looking out at the the natural world it can be really hard to see patterns because it seems all seems so very like complicated and for another 20 and yep. here it's you know very bridge, very bridge obvious when you have this zero, these transitions eight, from none of these uh, organisms on the bottom to really thick bands uh, right on right on top of these darker colored dikes mm. and so some of these more subtle transitions of, of depth gradients that will uh, Taylor Ann was commenting a little bit on that earlier but uh, that will take us uh, a bit more time to unpack back in the lab. Um, but nonetheless, it's it's really interesting and helpful to think about uh, how the zonation works when you have some of these sort of uh, slightly less diverse systems and less populated. So this is all for Ignacio's thesis? Yes. Maybe Ignacio wants to tell us what are you going to do with it all? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Um, well, <laughs> well, obviously we're going to be making these um, photograph, uh, photomogram machine models, um, and hopefully get some comparison between older, um, older comparisons from the Okeanos when they came back in uh, 2011, I believe. Um, so there's been quite a, about a couple of years since that last expedition, and we're hoping to create these models and import them into a different program called Cloud Compare. And oh. in that program, we can overlay <laughs> these two different models to see how the sh how changes have occurred over time, to see the structural complexity, um, how life might um, prefer one area over the other, and the differences in yeah, the upgrading. Uh, 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 Dasha, have this. you had a chance to look at the 2011 Okeanos Explorer stuff? Yeah, so we were looking at them last night in order to plan out this dive today. Uh, and how three, different three, do they look from what we're seeing line, here? Line. Yeah, so in I did... In a casual, did a casual sense. I know that's going to uh, be the okay, topic of your thesis, but just, you know, did they have tons much, tons more life, less life? Yeah, so it seemed as if it's on par with what we saw before. Um, and to me, it felt like it was a little bit less. Um, I think the image we're getting today is um, more high def and um, more widespread as well. So we're seeing more coverage of the area as we mm -hmm. go up the slope. And um, some of the main differences were uh, the distance we're doing, we're going from um, bottom up. And the other expeditions um, sure. did get a wide range uh, of slope, but it was um, one of them it seemed as if they only got maybe a quarter way before they switch gears and move to a different um, site parallel to the to the first site, and then once they did that, they went up, and so they they got partial coverages Across of this mountain slope while we're getting a full coverage from the, uh, top to bottom. Back to, uh, yeah, I'm trying to understand form. what we're seeing here. Is this uh, just the little edge of an outcrop? It's quite quite thin. There's certainly a crack associated with it. Ready for another mm -hmm. down. Yep. Bridge, bridge, nav, two zero, two eight zero. Yeah, it looks like it's building too as we're we're scanning over to the side. Yeah, so it's just, just a very, very thin flow. That's created enough I guess enough of a topographic uh, 
effect to be a good place for these guys to hang out on. Somebody wrote in uh, that they're all waiting in line for an ERA's ticket. Another Taylor Swift reference. <laughs> <laughs> That is so cool. Yeah, very striking. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a zipper. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Well, what, what was, was that? that? Somebody shot by. Yeah, so this looks like a relatively thin flow, not as thin as that other one we just saw, but uh, and then does that, that drop down on both sides, or is it just on this side that we have that step? Uh, say again. I'm just wondering if it drops down on the back side too. Uh, yeah, we we, like we see this clear drop in front of us. I'm just wondering on the other side if it's if it's elevated like that or Yeah. Uh give me a second here, I'll yeah. chase it this way a little and then we'll turn and come back mm -hmm. uh lying over it. Looks like the Great Wall of China, you know? Yeah. yeah. It looks Look at like the writing the on the bottom R <laughs> up, uphill side is Ancient silted, isn't it? What that? Talk about a road, huh? Somebody's built a road here. Shame it's not yellow bricks, you know. Yeah, that's <laughs> that made me think of that too. That's, that's the last, the last Nautilus cruise that found the, nut, the yellow brick road. Mm. Um, somebody wrote in: Do you, the crinoids and corals prefer to attach to hard surfaces versus sediment? It looks like it. it certainly it seems, seems that way. It seems absolutely clear that that's yep. what's happening. Uh, yeah, less likelihood to slide and fall down yeah. on a rock mm -hmm. uh, formation like this. And you can see again here, this this dike sort of has the central area. Um, and then okay. everything seems to it's appear right to on live the on, on the, yeah. the edges of it. Yeah, not yeah. in the middle. So it must be a slightly different formation. And I'm sure if we, had, if we had dye markers in the, in the water, when you saw the current down. coming, it would be on the edges yep. where it's swirling. Yeah. Bridge, bridge now. Two zero two eight zero. That turbulence, and they're taking advantage of it. Yep. This is cool. Very, very <laughs> neat. Yeah. <laughs> this is really cool. Uh, look here, left a little for me. Chase it out to the south here for a minute. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the things that, you know, Ignacio will be looking at a little bit more, like sort of how consistent are some of these patterns in terms of placements of organisms. Uh, yeah, it's a classic so it case like of here resource the, on, on the upper side here, the, the sediment's coming almost right up to it, and then there's a big drop on that side. Yeah. As, as where we started from, it looked like uh, there was a drop on both sides. We're close enough to the hour. I wonder if we put the lasers on, just get an idea how thick that is. It's so consistently, right. in, it's consistent in its thickness. It is, I'm, just, isn't it? I'm just wondering how thick it is. Oh, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Uh, Dan, you think we could do that? Yeah, lasers are on already. Oh, they are. Yeah. I can't, I can't see them. So, uh, yeah. maybe six, 60 centimeters, a meter. Oh, oh, there, now I see him. Yeah, okay, yeah, so just about a, yeah, 60 centimeters to a meter. All right, that's good to know. Yeah. Great to have some scaling. It's easy to lose track when you're yep. Yep. in the deep sea here. And there, there it disappears. Yep. 
Goodbye. <laughs> Someone Fantastic. is asking if they can, if the crinoids can move. That's a Tracy Ann question. I think we, we heard before that some mm -hmm. do, right? The crinoids move. Sorry, I missed that. What was the question? The question. Um, yeah, we're talking about the movement of the crinoids again. Yeah, uh, I've heard that these this species of crinoid can walk, like with those appendages you see. Yeah. Other crinoids um, swim, and they're, it's really beautiful when you see them swim. Um, and then there are stalked crinoids that don't move at all um, after their planktonic stage when they're larvae. Mm -hmm. So there's this variation among yeah. crinoids. There's, yeah, lots of different types. And uh, a previous comment said something about how there was some video on that. I think Noah maybe had video. I can't remember. Um, but you can, I encourage you to go look at that. <laughs> Someone's calling it the Great Hawaiian Wall. <laughs> <laughs> 1,500 meters below. <laughs> yeah, it's actually just 1,100 meters. But, uh, uh, yeah. What's what, 400 meters amongst friends? Yeah, we're about... Oh, that's cool. Ready for one more down? Ready. Bridge, bridge now. Two zero two eight zero. The way the sediment falls on some of these makes them look like almost like like ancient ruins. Yeah. No, I, uh, I agree, like... So we climbed about 330... 30 meters from where we started. I've got another 300 meters to go. So standing up. Yeah, for those of you just joining us, we are um, a little over a thousand meters deep. And we nice are looking at these cool dike formations. There go. It's right here. Type oh, in any questions you. you have. We would love to answer them. Yep. Ah, wow, look at this yeah. again. Here we go. What's that big white thing there? Yeah, I'd say for the deep sea, it's been pretty, uh, pretty poppy, populous with organisms for like <laughs> over 300 meters. What's the, what's the big white thing? Anyone know? Is that a fish with two eyes? I can't quite tell from this distance. Now the volcanologists get real excited now because you see you see the one dike in one direction and another that's split off in another direction. And now they're joining up. Very cool. Oh, there was something there. Fish that swam by. Uh, sorry, there I was drinking water. The white thing, I think, is a piece of dead coral. Well, the one in the sand little, there. Not, not the one in the middle. The one off between the between all the crinoids. Yeah, right there. Lots of white things. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one's kind of speckled. Uh, the one, yeah, I don't know. It's also a goniastrid sea star, not too far from the white thing that uh, Larry is mentioning. It's a little farther to the right. The sea star just went off screen, though. 
does look like a coral yeah, skeleton. Yeah, a coral standing up. I'm not sure what the other white matter is below it, though. Yep. Yeah, I'll get going in Those a second. Corals. Yep. Ready for another dim? Mm, uh, give me a second. Uh, somebody's asking if uh, the right, Nautilus live page, for for the, heading change. Uh, the box Roger. is the only way to interact. Is there a telegram chat or something? No, as far as I know, that's just the the white box or also social media. Um, but I don't, I'm not entirely sure about that. Um. Yeah, this is this is what the, the next comment is talking about, cross-cutting relationships. So you, you see yeah. that the, the flow on top cut off the flow on the bottom. Yeah. So you, <laughs> you can show that that one is younger than, than the one below. Maybe. Or maybe they just diverted. <laughs> <laughs> it could be contemporaneous. And, we and could uh, put on one of the van cams yeah. if we wanted to set three. We did our our laser business at this hour. We had it just a few a minutes fish. ago. The laser, so we don't need to turn it on again. Oh, yeah. Sorry, were you requesting lasers? No, no, no. Oh, I said, sorry. you know, we we we're trying to do them on the hour or every hour, but we did it a few minutes ago when we we had the the nice uh, zippered <laughs> staircase. So, the, um, so I think we've got that covered for for Jonathan. Okay, I'm ready if he's at the bridge is ready. Uh, let's give him a second. All right. Yeah, the thrusters are working pretty hard right now, so. Okay, we'll uh, come back down the other side and we're waiting for the bridge to uh, change their head there a bit. They're there, so okay, once it stabilizes, we can, we should be able to go whenever. Yep, I'm ready. Bridge, bridge nav, 20280. Uh, someone's asking, is this the original orientation of this volcanic formation, or has it been shifted any since it formed? And, and that's a great question. I wish I knew the answer. Um, <laughs> no, no, ser ser seriously. I, I think we can tell, you know, the, when you see the, the columns like this, they were likely formed vertically, but I don't know, really. Uh, but, and, and so I think there's been some, some changes to their original orientation, but I, I really don't know. Um, and uh, that's a, I think we need some local some local volcanology uh, expertise for that one. And I think you'd get a good idea of seeing what the land exposure is and how it looks there. There you can see a nice dike cross-cutting that other one. Certainly been a lot going on over here.
Someone's asking, is it Niskin time? Uh, <laughs> Niskins are in the hangar. Uh, sorry, in the crane hold. Stowed. We yeah. usually have uh, six Niskins on the vehicle, and uh, we removed them for uh, slicked up for camera ops. We are, yeah, not in sampling mode for this expedition, but uh, yeah, you know, since we've been starting to see a little bit more diversity of corals, if we were sampling, we could potentially take a Niskin. Um, usually we take Niskins when we see a, um, an area of high density or diversity of coral um, and sponges. That's what our, our researchers tend to be interested in, building libraries of, of uh, these uh, eDNA samples to get genetics of the potential corals that live in the, the area. But yeah, for, for this uh, expedition, we're not collecting uh, any Niskins. Okay, headed up. Was that a sea star right there? Ready for another dance? Yeah, right. Aww. It was. Yeah. Bridge nav two zero two seven zero. It looks like we're starting to see some potential hard corals here. Yeah. These white, uh, maybe an elapsamia. I can never pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, these white coral fans that have thicker bases and branching than the other corals we're seeing. So somebody wrote in the cooling joints, the columnar joints form perpendicular to the cooling surface. The jointing will reflect where the cooling surface was. Also, dikes can inject at nearly any angle, not just vertical. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's commenting that we ha have seen very few sea stars, only one or two. Maybe nothing good to eat. Yeah, that's a good observation. I know um, some sea stars do like to eat, uh, feed on coral, like the bamboo coral. That's a, a predation and association that we've seen quite often on previous expeditions. i um, surprised we haven't seen any. Oh, but speaking of, there yep, is yep. one right there. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a nice size one. That's the largest one we've seen so far. They, they heard you speaking about them. They said, I, I better get in the picture before they count us out. They said, we're here, don't worry. <laughs> Sorry, where do you see it? Oh, the ICC, ICC. That's a representative of the Sea Star community. We have a viewer from Palau. Hi, Palau. Hello. Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> Uh, we have two scientists from the Ocean Exploration Trust in Palau today. 
Oh, yeah? And yesterday, yeah, meeting with the, the prime minister. And oh, I think, yeah, Megan was posting. She posted on Facebook. She was over there. Ready for one more, Dan? Yep. Bridge, bridge, now. Two zero, two seven zero. Someone is commenting that uh, maybe how shallow that we're getting um, is more ideal for sea stars. I've definitely seen a lot of sea stars at really deep depths. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Uh, I think it just could be a limiting food source, but yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's another one there too. Yeah. We've yeah. also had this uptick in corals right around here. And yeah. that sort of preceded the sea stars a little bit. Yeah. What, what's our current depth, Taylor? It is... 1,041. Oh, All thank right. you. Got a lot of buttons to push over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that did seem to be a pretty distinct transition. Yeah. Uh, a little after 1,100, we started seeing a lot more of these corals and, and then following that, these sea stars. So it'll be interesting to see if the... Oh, I can see the figure in Ignacio's thesis already. The yeah. Depth yeah. versus yeah. dominant species. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so this is the really cool thing about um, this type of 3D photogrammetry work is that we can fully reconstruct this this whole model and then start to apply uh, machine learning, like automated algorithms to detect what's on it and um, turn, you know, what would be uh, thousands of hours of, of counting everything into, uh, hopefully we can get that into at least a semi-automated workflow to look and at some of these trends. And after done with his one study, yeah, and I it gets read by... Uh, Chat GPT, you just have to go to <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> write me a thesis about the distribution. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this works pretty unique because we get to quantify these changes in um, uh, biodiversity as the depth continues to change. Oh, look at, uh, look, pretty look, excited about this. Look at that below, yeah. that contact below. That is spectacular. Yeah. It's holding back the avalanche. Wow. <laughs> well, you can see. The, the, you can see where little little things fall down. Yeah. Good for another time. Oh boy, yeah. Bridge, that's really, bridge that's really something. Dan, how far apart are the beams spread on the DVL? Uh, that's a good question. Aren't they 30 degrees? I believe they are, yeah. Yeah. And if you get two hit in the top and two hit in the bottom, they average? <laughs> what do they do? I think that's how they do, yeah. I have the raw beams if you want to see them. Is it something we could look at? Yeah, I can pull, I can pull them up and graph them. One second. Yeah. <laughs> you just happen to have a navigator that can pull up the DVL beams and graph them. <laughs> <laughs> we also have them. They're in a in a, in the SolidWorks model, aren't they? Is that where you? Uh,
There we go. Larry, if you pull up the uh, Norbit computer, you can see them. Okay. The, uh, th I believe that's in millimeter or centimeters, those ranges. Mm -hmm. And these are the four beams. With yeah, that's colors. the raw data from the. I did not know we had that capability. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you five bucks for it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, which beam do I keep losing? Uh, it looks like the orange. The, that's the that's beam three. I don't know. I am not sure what beam correlates to what at this time. Yeah, yeah. Up on top, of the orange is beam three. Yeah, it's beam three, but I don't know what. I don't know how they're oriented, and the DVL is like oriented forty-five degrees off yeah, and stuff. I so I'm not really. I'm a little confused as I to. I don't know why we orient it forty-five degrees. Degrees it, off. Just I don't to know. It stay doesn't, confusing. It doesn't bother me, but you ready for another move? Yeah, sure. Bridge, bridge, nav. Uh, another twenty two seven zero. Because the units on the y axis. Yeah, the units on the y axis are centimeters, I believe. It sends the ranges mm -hmm. up as uh, integers, as so okay. it, they, they, yep. uh, like I said, this is the raw, unprocessed data mm -hmm. from okay, the DVL. So, yeah, so, so as we were on the edge, and it looks like we had, you know, two. That's just what I was asking. Two, two beams were were seeing far, and two beams were, were seeing near. Yeah, so it looks like red and orange are probably the DVLs on the right hand side of the vehicle so I think the red and orange are the, the ones that are on the right hand the side. The farthest right, okay. Yeah. And so the question then is, you know, so with those, wh what is, what's the final range it's giving at that, at that point? I, I think it's giving us the average. Yeah, okay. Interesting. I can plot the average too if we want and we can see how it goes. Uh, we've some, some seen some We're very, gonna, very uh, cool stuff. Come Jonathan. up here. We've seen some very cool stuff. Yeah, I'd say that piece of wood was the highlight. <laughs> oh, no, we've seen better than that. <laughs> oh, no, don't get Johnny started on that. There's a starfish. Whoa. <laughs> don't, s don't tell me you guys saw a cuke, though. Oh. I, yeah. said, I did That's lots cute. of highlights, millions of highlights of cucumbers for you. Hey, Jacob, these are really kind of perpendicular. Hope. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. I mean, if I'm just, I'm reading the DVL, or at least the Hertz altitude, and it, it looks like the average of those two. Yeah, it must yeah, be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could be the average, or it's like fitting a plane and finding the center point, mm -hmm. which I kind of doubt they're doing that, and they're just finding the average. Right. And now they're uh, still the orange one's a little, a little out. But maybe I need to plot these so I can map with the DVL when my orbits broke. Yeah. I've always uh, understood them to be an average. Yeah. Now that's an urchin there, that the pink fuzzy uh, thing. Uh, there's a pink fuzzy urchin. That's a fun one. You ready for another move, Dan? Sure. Bridge, bridge, nav, another two zero meters, two seven zero.
someone's asking, why are there no fish or crabs or stuff here? <laughs> well, if you see there, there is a little shrimp. <laughs> um, but yeah, we have seen some fish. We've seen some eel-like fish. Um, not too sure. We've also seen one Ophidiformis fish um, and an Alovandria fish. They're just not high in density, probably for the similar reason we're not seeing a lot of other species other than these filter feeders and those that can just feed in the water column. Um, there's just not much food source here that they would be interested in at this, like, at this, in this area. Um, but we have seen a couple of fish. The first yeah, stalk sponge we've seen in a while. We just passed over. Mm. It was a eupectelid sponge. What's a geologist's favorite fruit? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Pomegranate. Pomegranate. Oh! oh I knew it! <laughs> you gotta give me a sec. You know? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> One more, Dan. This place. Bridge, bridge nav, 20270. Two Someone commented it's habit for them to avoid